من از اونجایی که فارسیم حالا شاید باور نکنیم ولی من سیکل با سیکل ایران اینجا هستم وقتی صحبت های خیلی کامپلیکیتد میشه من سویچ میکنم انگلیسی در نشه تصمیم گرفتم این پرزنتیشن رو به انگلیسی انجام بدم اگر سوالی بود در مورد ترجمه مطمئنا کسایی دیگه هستن که ترجمه کنن um, So what I thought about was to start with Will's psychological profile. So if you go into, um, if you Google reviews of this book, you'll, you'll see the, yeah. Oh, sure, sure. I'm um, Mariam Ibrahim Purasam, a psychotherapist in Toronto and in field of mental health, a youth mental health center. I'm working with children mental health issue دارن addiction دارن و youth justice um, برای همین در از من خواسته شد از طرف ناصر که بیام صحبت کنم در مورد این کانسپت که توی uh, توی این فیلم هستش um, uh, I'm going to start talking about the psychological profile of Will and then start talking about the relationship uh, with the, the therapeutic relationship between Sean and Will and a little bit context of what's going on. Obviously, there's, there are so many cliches and Holly, Hollywood style of how they're taking a look at a relationship between a therapist and, and uh, a client. When you look at Will's profile online or even in the movie, he talks about attachment disorders. There's, there's speculations of whether he has post-traumatic stress disorder and potentially um, anxiety. Um, if you're not familiar with attachment disorders, they, they can be a cause, they can be caused by neglect or abuse uh, from early age and they result in various forms of symptoms. Uh, for example, there could be aggression, difficulties in relationships, difficulties with trusting, uh, forming trusting and loving um, relationships with with uh, same age partners and also adults and uh, also youth justice involvement um, so when we look at when we look at will, will we clearly see that he has uh, uh, he's having difficulty forming relationships with uh, uh, loving relationships he's clearly has a long history of abuse that he mentions that's, um, there's quite a bit of evidence in what, uh, where that comes from. There's research on adverse childhood effects that shows that there's a direct link between childhood uh, trauma with aggression, with uh, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, and uh, justice involvement. So where is that coming from? Um, and what has happened um, what happens to people when they get hurt by the people that love them the most? Um, that's basically grounded in the science of attachment. I'm just going to show you guys a, move, a very short clip just to demonstrate that. This is a two minute experiment that was done. Um, this is a clip of a two minute experiment that's done and it talks about a very small impact of what could happen when adults don't respond properly to children. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying 30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And the still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly 
picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Okay, my voice on. Okay. So you can see in those two minutes the impact of what happens to a child. So now imagine Will has gone through 20 years of abuse. He's gotten stabbed, he's gotten burned. Um, clearly no responsible adults that were responsive to him throughout his life. So he had to develop his own coping skills. Uh, studies show that we develop positive and negative coping skills and in reality whatever coping skills that we pick when we're growing up with anything as little as this or as extensive as being abused um, they're they're very responsive in that moment and they're keeping the child and the person alive and helping them cope uh, with whatever is in, happening in that moment when it becomes negative or uh, to their disadvantage is how it, it cannot change and form into other uh, circumstances. So clearly in Will's situation, uh, what was happening is that he needed to be aggressive in order to survive in a very aggressive foster home. Uh, what he wasn't working is when you go out in the community and you kick uh, a cop in the shin, you get arrested. So you can, you can just see an experience that if this, if this was happening for two minutes to a child and it was so dysregulating, what the impact is on Will. So when we, when we look at Will, clearly aside from his negative uh, coping skills, which is the aggression, the, the ability to avoid uh, relationships and vulnerabilities, he has a lot of positive coping skills. And those positive coping skills are resiliency. So um, resiliency, the, key, um, the definition of resiliency is being able to bounce back from adverse effects and we all have resilient factors that's how we survive and so does well part of the resiliency uh, is being able to be uh, acknowledged for doing being good in school or being able to be acknowledged for it and being noticed clearly he has a high IQ that has kept him um, doing fairly okay I mean he's he has a long rap sheet rap sheet to follow him around um, but that's not enough. It's not just enough to have high IQ and to do good in school or to do good at work. In order to survive, we're social beings. We have to have relationships and we have to be able to rely and be vulnerable to other people. And that's what's missing for him. So that's what he's getting out of the relationship he's developed with Sean, who Robin play, uh, William plays. Um, before I get into their relationship, I want to talk about the history of it because I, I'm not really sure if they even knew what they were doing in this movie in terms of they've developed this emotional relationship and this story and whether this was intentional, I don't know. I'll leave it to the experts to talk about that. But in terms of historically, client, and when we're looking at where they're at 20 years ago, I don't think they had 
the foresight to know what's coming ahead in the in the science of therapy, but historically, at the very beginning, and, and there's mentions to hypnosis, he does a session of hypnotism with another clinician, and there's talks about, uh, you see the, the couch, the, um, it's very much like a cliche, you see a couch in every clinician's office where people can lie down. That's actually not the case. It was uh, in 17, 1700s, which is when hypnotism came along. And so back when hypnotism came along, the very beginning stages of the concept of therapy, the, the notion was the patient or the person is, in, is not in charge of what's happening in their bodies. And that there is a, there's a magnetic force that needs to be directed through someone's facilitation. So Mesmer, who the term mesmerizing comes from in fact, is the founder of this school of thought where he thought that we have, um, that he in fact has magnetic powers and so he would, he would feed his patients uh, some sort of a liquid with with iron in it and he would move his hands and hope that through movement this ailment psychological or physical would move out of the person and so at the beginning stages of therapy and you know essentially where hypnotism comes from nobody's in charge of uh, the process of healing and it just happens by by unraveling things that are that have been um, dug into the, the subconscious. Uh, when, when we go forward, and I mean, they talk about Freud in here as well. Um, Freud, we're, we're talking late 1800s, so it's 1890s. Again, his, his mentality, or he's, he's the, the very first people who thought of the concept of doing therapy he's also not talking in the sense of a, developing a relationship with his patients. He's thinking that, uh, again, we're not in control of, our, of who we are and our nature and whether they've experienced sexual abuse or any sort of abuse, especially he, he became fascinated with um, sexual stages of, uh, of development in, in people. Um, again, we're, we're sort of at mercy of our nature and we sort of have to just live with it and just recognize that they're there. We've come a long way. That was 100 and, uh, I'm losing count of it, 130 so years ago. But, um, you know, we, we, we owe a lot to Freud in the sense of he started the concept of therapy and he started some of the ideas around being able to develop some sort of a stage of development for human beings, but but you know a lot of his theories have been debunked, and uh, we're we're just un, you know understanding human body in a different way. His theories could not be proven right or wrong because they were not grounded in any sort of science. But as we've we've moved into the concept of uh, psychology as a science, looking at neuroscience and brain uh, brain sciences, we can actually see the impact of. Uh, therapy and what's happening. So we move forward to like mid 1900s and you know 1950s. We have Carl Rogers who's who's taking a look at a relationship that's very one way again. So there's a therapist and a patient. The patients, um, it's very client centered. So the patient's now in charge, but again the relationship is one way. There is no reciprocation. But when we move to 21st century, which is Nowadays, there is a concept called safe and effective use of self. It's a brand new subject. I don't think Ben Affleck knew about it back in the 1990s. I don't think that's what he intended to do. But essentially, there is, there is belief and science in the fact that um, any treatment has to be trauma-informed. That means that we have to understand that almost all of us have experienced trauma. And so in order to be able to heal, we have to address those traumas. But in order to address those traumas, you have to create safe spaces where people can come and develop safe, uh, secure relationships with that therapist. And in order to do that, the therapist has to be willing to bring themselves into the room. They can't be a blank slate and walk in and do what you see on TV, which is a therapist just saying, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And the person's lying on a couch and just having what Freud would have those free associations and just talk forever and ever. In fact, a therapist has to be very self-aware, 
have to do a lot of personal work in order to be able to be present in the room in the room and the direction that you're using is a trauma-informed direction so that's essentially what Sean is doing in the movie I don't know if he knows that what he's doing but he's bringing his story into the room and through bringing his story into the room and talking about his process of experiencing safe ther safe relationship with a loving adult that was um, very much bi-directional and being able to exp talk about his experiences of trauma and loss he was able to let this child essentially a 20 year old is still a child there's science that now shows our brain doesn't stop growing till we're 25 so we're talking about a 21 year old that uh, just for you guys to know government of Ontario has now recognized that youth go up to age of 29 so we're talking about a child. So here's an, here's an adult man who's trying to r role model what a healthy attachment looks like to him. And that's what he's doing. It's not an easy job. I, I know this is a movie. He's doing it, I don't know, like twice a week for, I don't know, a few months. But this is, this is essentially what the process looks like. Um, am I doing our time? I'm good. I'm good. So just, just to wrap things up, um, the, uh, the reason that we're talking about this is there's in fact science that shows, and we can talk about it further, but there's now um, neuroscience that looks at the brain and how we ab we're able to manage pain when we, when we go through the process of therapy. So Dr. Sue Johnson, who actually works out of Ottawa. She's a psychologist. She has now started to look at couples and their pain tolerance. And they put, um, she puts the couples into an fMRI b before a therapeutic session starts. And while they're in an fMRI, she shocks them with, with electricity and, met, and records the, the brain waves that impact, that, that show pain and then puts them through process of a therapy, sees them through however many mo uh, number of sessions, and again, does the same thing, gives them a shock, um, records their brain waves, and in fact, uh, adults who go through uh, couples therapy are able to, to show in their brain activity and also in their self-report that they don't experience as much pain when they're with their partners. So there's quite a bit of science that has come along in all these years. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about other things, but I think in terms of time, I just wanted to wrap this up. Um, you know, there, there's clearly there, were, there was an attempt from Ben Affleck to explore this relationship. Uh, and I think in, in the fact that he probably didn't know so much about the science and was working from the human relationship, I think he captured quite a good realistic uh, understanding of what it takes to, to go through that process.